Guinea-Bissau first, where Mbalo has taken over, the opposition leader essentially coming to the forefront. Uh, and then looking at Malawi, they have less than 150 days at this stage to hold a re-election. And we'll see if Peter Motarika is essentially going to appeal that process. Ahmed and Chukudi Ezugu, who's a political commentator and a friend of the channel. Thank it's you. safe to say that, Thank right? You <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me, gentlemen. So we're focusing quite a bit on West Africa, starting in Guinea-Bissau, where the opposition party leader, surprisingly, Umaro Sisoko Mbalo, has been declared the winner of the second round of presidential elections that, of course, you'll know were held in December last year. The National Electoral Commission made this announcement earlier this week upon request by ECOWAS for the verification of those results. He beat his contender, Domingo Simues Pereira, by about 54%, and the ruling party, PAIGC, took to Twitter to condemn the Electoral Commission for what they have called a lack of transparency. Pereira has vowed to continue to contest these results. Let's take a look at what happened at this constitutional court when this ruling was made. Okay, so they were hoping for a turn of events mm -hmm. when they uh, essentially had the, the votes recounted and they mm -hmm. confirmed uh, that Sisoko Mbalo is now the new president, well, the president-elect of the country. What does that mean um, for a, a Guinea-Bissau that has seen a ruling party that took it into its independence and now a new leader, a party that's, what, barely a year old coming into the fray? What does that mean for the country? I think it's indicative of the fact that the people desire change and would go all out to enthrone that change. It is really unfortunate that for you know the average politician, the election elections uh, to them it's your desperate means to perpetuate yourself in power. It's essentially supposed to be like you know the people expressing their will to say these are those we want to. Um, administer over the affairs of our country. But unfortunately, you have a situation where, you know, people in their desperation to retain power will circumvent the system. Now, you have the ruling party that is particularly pained about the outcome of the elections because there's a lot of history, you know, the struggle for independence, trying to build a greater Guinea-Bissau. But unfortunately, if the people reject you, it's important that you just say, okay, we'll go back, strategize, and see how we can, you know, in subsequent elections, mm -hmm. win. Because it is really very, very clear that if you're the ruling party that control, you know, the apparatus of state and the electoral commission is essentially, you know, the, the principal is essentially the person in control. And at the end of the day, you lose the elections and you say, you know, you condemn the outcome, lack of transparency. It shows that you also failed in your responsibility to create an enabling environment for institutions of government to function and for the people to express their will. Mm -hmm. I would just advise, you know, the ruling party to just take it in their stride, go back, re-strategize, and see how they can convince the people. Because across, you know, not just um, West Africa, across the world, where you have you know, populations that are increasingly young, people desire change. The world is now really you know, very closely knitted. People get to view things that are happening in other parts of the world. So they say, I mean, we are tired of this system. We want something different. So it's important they just accept and move on. I like that yeah. you, you made mention of the youth because I'd like us to speak a little bit about why Mbalo has this uh, appeal to the youth. But I'd like to speak to you, Latif, about the fragile peace in the country and what this turn of events means for the likelihood that they'll be able to keep you know, this peaceful transition intact now that we know that the ruling party is not happy with the results. Yeah, and so that is what happens when you win an election. You have to be magnanimous in, you know, you know, in a situation like that. Um, it is fair enough to say that um, he was with the ruling party before he, you know, created his own movement, and then he was able to mass a lot of support. Uh, what he was able to do uh, was to uh, appeal to the desire of the youthful um, population. He was able to touch on their, you know, their most important needs, their hope and desires, you know to move the country beyond what it is at the moment. So for the fragility of, you know, peace or the, um, you know, to sustain the peace that exists in the country at the moment, he should be able to look towards the ruling party and say, well, you may not be in power at the moment, 
but there are rules and responsibilities that we can run together. You know, it's not uh, a winner takes all thing. It has to be, you know, a collective decision to move on. And for the um, ruling party that has lost power, it should be able to strategize and say, well, in the forthcoming election, if we do not win the most important po uh, positions in, in, in leadership, what, how about um, the parliament, for example? Because you need all of these institutions to um, ensure that democracy is pro properly gr grounded in, in, in a country. Just speaking on, on, on the topic of the parliament, you know, it, it's not clear as yet what the cabinet is going to look like, but the likelihood is that uh, because you know uh, the, the the PAIGC leader was just a little bit behind him the likelihood is that he'll be a president with a government that is filled with uh, ruling pa party. former ruling party, party members. members so how do you see that working how is he going to be able to create a government of his own vision given that he's likely to be working a lot with well, um, an old guard I think it's essentially about the interest now politicians are essentially one and the same so long as you know the, their interests align they will do all that they can. But it is also really very, very important to sell the idea of a new Guinea-Bissau. Yes. Looking at the population of the country, you have young people. I mean, it's a problem across Africa. Young people who aspire to greatness and feel that they cannot attain set goals yes. in their primary place of origin will likely go out and struggle. So where you have you know, that dispersal, where you have a lot of Africans, in parts of Europe and in America, struggling to survive. You would wonder why, you know, with a country that is blessed with abundant human and natural resources, you cannot explore the tremendous potential so that you can, you know, consolidate. Now, what he should do is try to sell the idea that it is about enduring legacies and it's not essentially about what I would gain and what you would gain. We would want a country that, you know, young people would remember us for all that we did for them. and you know, think about posterity that would judge us. So it's important that you begin to look at the aspirations of young people and their problems, because in all fairness, a lot of these people who are the major gladiators in this situation will be long gone in say 10, 20 years, but their, their, their legacy would remain. So if you put in enduring legacies in place, people would remember you for all that you have done. So it's important that you sit at a round table and understand that if we all go into this because of what we want to get, we would end up destroying ourselves. Mm -hmm. Let's think about the young population and think about young people and what essentially will we be remembered for. So I think that way you can convince you know, somebody who sees you as somebody they can work with. But unfortunately, politicians are really very obstinate. Mm -hmm. And if it, if it doesn't favor them, because right now it's essentially about what I will get and if I would lose out in such a situation. So it's really very, very important that you come from the angle of we're building a new Guinea-Bissau, hopefully for posterity to judge us right and about our enduring legacy. You've just mentioned uh, Mbalo and, and the young population. I, what do you think his appeal is? Apart from the fact that he was one of the younger candidates, yes. what, what is his appeal really? Is it really just his speak on change, uh, you know, speaking truth to power? Is that really what young people are looking to hear? Well, young people want to try out new ideas. And so if you create a situation where you allow them to express themselves, you allow them to go all out, you know, take all the risk, whether they succeed and whether they fail, it's essentially the lessons that they can imbibe good for them. Now, he, I mean, he identified it quickly and he was able to capitalize on that. Whether it would translate into good governance, yes. it's a different ball game. But I think that, you know, somebody who is intelligent enough to look at the mistakes of the, uh, the ruling party, because the truth is, I mean, the ruling party, just like other ruling parties across Africa, like ANC, ZANU-PF, think that they are well-grounded and nothing would happen. I mean, you just look at it and say, look at our history, look at the party, and look at all those who have done well in the history of the country. So it will be difficult for people to reject us. But it has gotten to the point where, you know, the young man sees what is happening in North Africa, in East Africa, in South Africa, and they just feel, I mean, we cannot continue to live with these sets of leaders. So we desire change. So it's really very, very important that it is not about the audio, uh, the audio format of saying, I'm young like you. I might not be as young as you are, yeah. but I think like you and I will do things differently. It's essentially about winning the trust of young people so that when they look at their leaders, they would say, yes, these are people we can trust and hopefully we'll consolidate and build a greater country. Okay, and then, yeah. you know, just finally, 
we often speak about, ah, you know, uh, they're agitating for a new country, but is this person ready to govern? What makes Mbalo different, and I suppose special, is that he has been prime minister, so he, he understands the inner workings of what it takes to govern a country. Do you yeah. think that's going to give him that additional edge just to be able to, to be a, a good president for the country? I think so strongly because he's an ex-military uh, officer. Yes. He has a background in international relationship. He uh, he's well grounded. Uh, he's connected to a lot of African leaders. So, given that background, he should be able to borrow, uh, you know, new leaves from w countries that things work, and then translate that into his own country. I believe he he's going to make um, a good president. Mm. And I mean, interestingly enough, in in just a very short time since he's been. Uh, confirmed as a leader he's already been doing regional tours yeah you get it uh, so That's, yeah it's, it's so he's really making from, sure from you know and, and then he speaks like three or four um, international languages yes. you know so it, it allows him to be able to you know uh, connect with a lot of people from across the world that's a good one for uh, Guinea. Yeah, so. Okay, so we'll be keeping a very close eye. Also, the PAIGC saying that they want to continue uh, to appeal these results. A little bit similar to another gentleman from the <laughs> south of Africa that we're going to talk about a little bit later, Mr. Mutarika. But we're going to take a short break. Tell us what you think on social media about the results that we've seen come out of Guinea-Bissau. And of course, after this, we're taking you to Togo. Uh, remember, our hashtag is NCTheConversation and our handle at New Central TV on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. We continue the conversation after the stay with us. I really wish there was a camera looking at what happens during the break because the conversations during the break are equally as interesting as the conversations on screen. Welcome back. It's the final stretch of the conversation and we're in Malawi now. So following the annulment that was announced earlier this week regarding Malawi's May 2019 election, protest leaders have threatened further demonstration. That's if a presidential election rerun is delayed. Remember, they've been given 151 days. Meanwhile, President Peter Motariga is appealing against the court's ruling that it invalidates his election election victory. Now, the former vice president, who also ran for presidency, Saulos Chilima, has demanded the immediate resignation of the head of the country's elections body, Ms. Jane Ansa. Chilima also asked on the international community to send election observers to ensure the credibility of the forthcoming elections. The court cited massive and widespread irregularities that include the use of correction fluids, so typics, on score sheets and gave orders that a rerun be held within the month. No, within the next three months. Let's take a look at what the Speakers of Parliament had to say. Members of Parliament are coming today. They will work even on weekend just to make sure we get this done. So we have given you ourselves timelines uh, as a secretariat as well as for our members of Parliament and the committees. I can assure you we are working around the clock and we'll make sure we get everything done. Uh, by the dates that the courts have uh, ordered us. We are actually following what the court uh, has said. So the right of appeal, everybody uh, does have. We cannot, we cannot stop anybody from doing that. So that will be going on. If the courts at any point say, uh, can you stop uh, this, we'll have to stop. So we are following what the courts are saying, and we will follow what uh, further direction. OK, so the president of the country is essentially asking to appeal the results of you know an election that has essentially been annulled, what are the odds that anything is going to change? I think that it's glaring that he's not as popular as he thinks, and you know this is just being this is just trying as much as you can to see it's clutching onto straws and seeing what you can do. It's really very very unfortunate that we have gotten to the point where you know when you conduct elections that are really very expensive. You don't allow the will of the people to prevail. Very, very unfortunate that you know people because they want to perpetuate themselves in power will do all sorts. Some of the evidence that have, that were tabled, you know, during the course of the litigation, were very clear that it was just desperation. You get to the point where figures did not tally. In certain places, they just outrightly borrowed <laughs> numbers from from the heavens and added it just so that they could, you know, show up the numbers. And it's really very, very unfortunate. If indeed public officials essentially want to serve the interests of the people, then allow the people to give you that mandate to represent them. But unfortunately, if you look at, you know, especially in Malawi and the desperation to remain in power, it's really very, very unfortunate. And I align my thoughts with the opposition leader that has called on, 
you know, the officials of the electoral body to quit the position because there is essentially no need and nobody will trust you to do a good job. So it's really very, very important that they allow, you know, new people get in the office and conduct the elections. And I would also like to emphasize that the African Union and other sub-regional organizations should not fold their arms and watch because, I mean, when it gets to the point where the politician feels he has lost out completely, I mean, the next would be civil strife. And unfortunately, it is the people who are going to suffer for it. So it was the African Union and SEDEC who observed mm -hmm. these elections and said they were above board. Saulos Chilima, who's uh, one of the opposition leaders, has asked that it be an entirely new uh, group of people, preferably international community, nobody from the continent. What do you make of this? And what, the conversations we always have about yeah. African solutions by African people, what, what, no, what happened me, to that? For me, that's call for international observers to be the umpire is childish, is unpatriotic. Yeah, because um, you, you've surrendered your nation's sovereignty in that context. I will not sub, sub, um, support or subscribe to that. But for me, if that's the right call, those people should resign and Malawians should come in and see conduct on other elections. But you see, it says, um, yeah, there's right of appeal. I, but Malawi, like he said, it's, it's, um, it's the citizens that is going to cry for it if they get it wrong. And the, the president being an incumbent, losing an election, or probably his election being thrown out shows you something. It doesn't conduct the it doesn't control the judiciary. It doesn't control the parliament, like we've seen. The body language of the parliament is that they are not supporting it. If he loves his country and he probably wants to rest or retire with with his glory intact, he should probably just let this run off. Or probably a new conduct, I sorry, a conduct of a new election should happen. Then if you now look at um the integrity crisis. I think any right-thinking person in the election, electoral commission should have resigned. Should have resigned. There's, you shouldn't wait for the opposition to call. You should train the tower well, unless you're promising Malawians that you conduct a free and fair elections. But who will, who will believe you? Mm. Nobody. Are you concerned about violence perhaps erupting in Malawi as a result of you know some of what we've seen happen if they don't remove Jane Ansa as the head of the Electoral Commission or if they find themselves delaying this 150 day period for the re-election? It's really a volatile situation. I mean um, if you look at Malawi one might argue that the chances are not really very high for an outbreak of violence but the truth is when people feel that they have been cheated you know, they would do anything to see that, you know, you don't get away with it. And that is where the danger lies. So it's really very, very important that they act quickly. Now, you have gone through litigation, you have the right to appeal. Put the information out there. This is the period that it would span. So it has the chance. I mean, everybody should have the opportunity. It's in his right. But it's also really very, very important that it is seen as, you know, there is progress. Those who are not supposed to occupy any position whatsoever should just try as much as they can to go very, very far <laughs> from the office and allow, I mean, control the supporters, you know, tone down the rhetoric and get to the point yeah. where it's essentially about the people. The truth is, if these elections are conducted in a free and fair atmosphere, I am very, very certain that the incumbent president is going to lose. But for me, I don't see violence breaking out because if you look at the, com um, the comportment, the actions, and probably of the opposition, they've been matured about it. They went to court. They, that means they believe in their judiciary. Except though, uh, everybody was very excited about the way the elections went down and everyone said, oh, you know, Malawi is known to be a peaceful country. Yeah, and then there was violence. No, but, yeah. but for me, and if you look at it, I don't, I probably, if I'm in the camp of the incumbent president, I would, have, I would just advise him, sir, please do not waste your time appealing this verdict because in law, commonsensical knowledge of law, the, each judgment of the higher courts is premised on subsequent judgments True. from the lower courts. So it's just going to be a waste of judicial mm -hmm. time. And if you're not bringing new evidences or new grounds of appeal, you even probably be incurring more costs because you'll now be ch charged or probably ordered to pay litigation fee of, a, of, of the opposition. So for me, I think it's just the right thing for him to just start preparing. And another thing is this, there could be a political solution to this. True. 
they could dialogue. I'm the yeah. incumbent president. Don't let us set up the policy. Why you guys are saying the war 50 days is enough for me as a commander in chief and president to negotiate the opposition and promise him a slot of a prime minister? So I, talk, I think like a politician. <laughs> That's the way. Okay, so you're essentially encouraging negotiation here. Hold on, I just want to cut you. Let's hear what the people in Malawi have to say. Human rights defenders uh, essentially becoming more and more militant, speaking about mass protests and more violence if heads don't roll. Take a look. So what we are saying is that if she can't resign uh, with her commissioners, uh, if the parliament cannot dissolve this commission, as HRDC, we are going to mobilize Malawians, are going to see the biggest or the mother of all demonstrations in Malawi. And actually, we are going to shut down uh, the offices of Malawi Electoral Commission because these are our offices. These are Malawians' offices. They use our tax. This time, actually, we are prepared to even do vigils in their homes for the next uh, elections. The appeal should not be a strategy to block uh, the process. They can appeal on the other hand, but also let the other processes of um, preparing for the next elections start. Okay, so they are promising to come guns blazing if they don't see Jane Ansa and the rest of the electoral committee. And of course, remember those judges who were bribed by those businessmen. They're looking for that entire old guard uh, to make its way out. What is the likelihood? Because you know, where there's the military involved and you're so deeply entrenched in the system, it's very difficult to undo all of that. Well, I think when it gets to the point where the people become more expressive, um, the best way is to just exit so that you can allow things simmer down. Now, what is really very, very um, critical in the Malawi situation is it's not about what goes on in Malawi and the major players. It's about external influence. There are people who are with their suitcases going around the world looking for where there's crisis. Now, these warmongers would only thrive where you have instability. And if they play into the hands of these people that are going to suffer for it, those who want to sell their armaments, those who want to explore the tremendous potential in the country to the detriment of the citizenry. So it's important that they just think about it and say, I mean, if we conducted general elections and the incumbent president was roundly beaten, that they had to get no, conjure numbers <laughs> like they are playing Lotto to just <laughs> show up. His, it's really very, very unfortunate. So I think he should just bow out when the ovation is loudest. Okay, final words very, very quickly. For me, the calm blazing might be they were just coming with doing guns, not AK-47. And for him, the, the God, warmongers would, Malawi is not a big market or a good market for them, so they won't be war in Malawi. Trust me. Malawi is too small. Okay, people of Malawi, that is the view of Mr. Dea Misaka and not News <laughs> Central. Thank you so much for watching the conversation. Thank you to my Thank guests you. for joining me. Remember, you can keep this conversation going on social media. What are your thoughts? We took you to Guinea-Bissau first, where Mbalo has taken over. The opposition leader essentially coming to the forefront. And finally, looking at Malawi, they have less than 150 days at this stage to hold a re-election. And we'll see if Peter Motarika is essentially going to appeal that process. Remember, for all the latest and current affairs, visit our website www.newcentral.africa. Until our next conversation, I'm Sibusisi Wenyanda. It's goodbye for me. Goodbye from me for now. <laughs>